Bem-vindos à quarta mesa do Fódio. É um enorme prazer estar aqui uh, convosco neste festival que se tem imposto no ano editorial como uma festa dos livros, da leitura, do encontro entre pessoas que gostam de ler, que escrevem, que mergulham na literatura e é um grande, uma grande honra estar aqui uh, convosco todos os anos com uma plateia sempre tão cheia. Muito obrigado ao Pedro Sousa pelo convite, à Câmara Municipal e todos os intervenientes na organização deste festival. Um, é também um prazer estar aqui com dois autores que eu tanto admiro uh, e cujos livros disponíveis em Portugal são leituras extraordinárias, por isso espero que a sessão seja não só inspiradora para quem ainda não leu, mas também um reencontro com dois livros uh, tão fortes. Um, eu vou fazer uma pequena apresentação dos autores em português, depois vamos mudar para inglês uh, no decorrer da conversa. Uh, há uma tradução simultânea disponível, não sei se há para as pessoas. Há, há a tradução disponível para as pessoas caso queiram uh, beneficiar delas, estejam à vontade. Vamos falar durante 50 minutos e depois nos últimos 10 minutos teremos a oportunidade para uh, as vossas perguntas, as vossas uh, curiosidades, as vossas uh, inquietações, dado que este ano o tema do festival também passa por aí. Uh, por isso, uh, nós hoje temos a Masa Magist, nasceu em Addis Abeba, na Etiópia, em 1974, uh, quando a sua família se exilou depois da, de, de, depois da Revolução Etíope, viveu na Nigéria, mais tarde na Itália, atualmente nos Estados Unidos. Publicou o seu primeiro romance em 2010, Benita Lion Gaze, uh, e uh, nove anos depois publicou o Rei Sombra, publicado em 2019 e disponível, disponibilizado pela Tinta da China em 2024, na coleção A Vida Privada dos Livros, dirigida por Alberto Mangel. Uh, Burgan Somnes uh, nasceu em Haimana, na Turquia, em 1965 e é atualmente o presidente do PEN uh, International. Uh, no seu país uh, formou-se em direito e envolveu-se nas lutas do seu tempo, quer como estudante, quer como advogado. Uh, foi preso em 1984 e uns anos mais tarde, em 1996, uh, brutalmente agredido pelas forças uh, do regime, o que levou ao seu uh, exílio no Reino Unido. Estreou-se uh, como romancista em 2009, em 2009 com Norte. Uh, em 2011 publicou Pecadores e Inocentes. Uh, em 2015 publicou Istambul, Istambul, também publicado em 2019 pela Dom Quixote em Portugal. É autor ainda de Labirinto, de 2018. Uh, a Pedra e a Sombra, que foi agora publicado pela Livros do Brasil e que será uh, como o Rei Sombra um dos pretextos para esta sessão. E um, um, o seu último livro, cuja tradução em português talvez seja mais difícil de encontrar, Lovers of France Kappa, uh, de 2024. Uh, nós vamos falar sobre amor, conjugando com a vida destes escritores, com a sua obra, uh, com o seu olhar uh, sobre o mundo. E então, uh, from this moment, we are going to talk uh, in English. I've just made a small uh, presentation to get to the point. It's such an honor to be here with you. Um, uh, I was challenged by my friends to sing a love song between every <laughs> question. Uh, but now that I stand here, I don't think it's a very good idea. But nevertheless, uh, in this session that it's dedicated to love, I just I only want to know what love is, if you know the, that quotation. <laughs> so do you, do you think it's possible, Maza, starting by you, yeah. do you think it's possible to write without a strong emotion that we might call it love? Oh. You can, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Thank you for that question. That's a really, really good question. Uh, I have often said that I, I think um, I write mostly about war. I have been writing a lot about revolution, and I know that I could not um, sustain those books or the process of writing about really horrible events if I did not have a, a very solid and a strong sense of what love means or what love is and if it if it did not if it did not guide me in the writing about what hate can do um, i have to understand the possibilities of love um, and i've often uh, 
thought about as I've studied different uprisings around the world over the course of so many hi different histories that uh, an uprising or a revolution always begins in the name of love. Mm -hmm. It is that, the kernel of that is love, that, that refusal to let other people, because they are poor or because they are of a different race or a different religion, to suffer. And so when people rise up, there is a love in that movement, even if it gets co-opted eventually by something else. But that first seed of rebellion and resistance, I think, is love. Yeah. Uh, 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 Boham, do you agree with this uh, vision? Uh, during the conversation, you can um, talk you can between yourself, and don't, the, you <laughs> don't have to wait for a question. So you feel free to, to, to interrupt whatever, whenever you want. Thank you very much. Um, it's you know, a very important point uh, to see love in connection uh, with the other part of uh, life, you know. Uh, but it's a uh, very uncomfortable topic. Love is everywhere in every minute of our life, but it's impossible to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, since yesterday, we've been joking about this. What are we going to say? <laughs> okay, you should speak. No, I should speak. And uh, you can write, you know, 4,000 pages, but when it comes to speak, you know, it is a great challenge. Um, you know, uh, maybe we should think about when we say love, what do we mean, actually? Uh, from my country's perspective in Turkey now, um, murdering women now, you know, like an epidemic spreading. And every man who murders a woman goes to the court and says, I was in love with her, Mr. Judge. And then they get discount in their sentence. So is it really love or something else? I l one of the best descriptions, because we are writers, we are talking about literature, one of the best descriptions for me is uh, in that story of a Little Prince. You know, little prince comes to Earth from another planet. He tries to understand what's going on on this planet, human beings and uh, animals, plants. Then he meets the fox, you know, and fox uh, tells him to stay on the Earth. But little prince says that I have to return to my planet because my home is over there. Then fox says, I start to love you. But what it means, and there is a cornfield, you know, wheat over there, and uh, yellow color, and little prince has blonde hair. Fox says, from now on, when I see this cornfield, you know, waving in the wind, I will remember your hair. Then I will love this field with a new feeling, because love is something changing the meaning of everything, not the person that we love or ourselves. Uh, you know, the city, the street, and even the life, you know, whole, whole changes, you know, like uh, yesterday we talked about Gabriel Garcia Marquez's novel, famous, you know, great title for love, Love in the Time of Cholera. Do we need to talk about love in that book or about cholera? Which one is a kernel? Which one is the center? And I think we can carry on from this point. In a sense, we can say that love connects people, uh, even if the end of the story is not what we expected, if, even, even if the revolution uh, guides to another destination, yes. uh, that's the substance that connects people. Yeah, and I, I, I think, Borhan, you know, you're asking, what is this thing that, that we use the word love mm -hmm. for an emotion that becomes so many other complicated things. Uh, and, but that feeling of, of a collective moving towards something or moving in the name of something that is greater than themselves yes. might be a, a part of love. Um, but I'm thinking, Burhan, of your book, um, Istanbul, Istanbul, which I believe is also translated. Yes, yes. It's a fantastic, fantastic book. And it's um, a story of these prisoners that are underground, 
and they tell stories to each other. And what I remember now listening to you speak is the story of love that would weave through, a man that fell in love with a woman that was at a cafe, and um, these, these kinds of stories or these kinds of memories, I think, also sustain us so that they make the moments that are, that are not about love possibilities towards that, that feeling again. Um, and I do like what you were saying about the fact that this emotion, which is an, which is an openness uh, to experience something else that's, that's, it's something else beyond just the physical. Like the, is it the prince? I have, the prince that sees this, the, the wheat yes. and imagines it as hair is beginning to understand that we are something more than our physical bodies, that there is another way that we can connect to human beings through memory, but it's that emotion is what makes that possible. Burham, do you think it's time to rewrite the philosophical history and say, uh, I love, therefore I am, and not I think, therefore I am, like Descartes used to say? <laughs> I think this question should be asked to Mars, and not me. <laughs> because isn't, but sometimes love is stupid, right? It's like, <laughs> maybe we should uh, think. <laughs> uh, uh, I think, you know, uh, there are so many things we can talk about this. So uh, one of the things I've been thinking in the last couple of days, you know, there are different forms of love. Uh, you know, you love your partner, you love your parents, your friends, your brothers, sisters, your country. They all love. And uh, I think the main thing for love is maybe it's easy to find, you know, love at first sight, but it's so difficult to build it up. You know, half past six. Yes, <laughs> it's a good time for love. <laughs> uh, because when you meet someone, you cannot call them friend immediately. You spend time, you go through some good and bad experiences, then you build up a trust, and then it turns into love. But the problem is for human beings, for us, it's so difficult to build it up, but it's so easy to destroy it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In a small mistake, we just delete, you know, friendship, or you know, our relatives, or even our partners. Is that the right thing? You know, uh, maybe the reason is we idealize it. Love means perfection. It shouldn't have a stain on it. Mm -hmm. But maybe we should learn how to keep it despite the cracks, mm -hmm. the mistakes. Nobody is, you know, flawless. I have problems, you know, like everyone. So we should try to understand, we should open space. Maybe in that way we can make love something living, you know, yeah. always there. Mm -hmm. uh, well, do you want to say no, something? No, no, go ahead. No, I, I was uh, uh, trying to... Um, go in another direction because maybe we, the, the conversation might get very abstract but uh, you are writers you have novels and i'm sure that uh, the love for your characters must be very important even though if even if the characters are a hateful one mm -hmm. um, how do you, could you describe your connection with the characters that you create the love that you have for them mm -hmm. and how important is to uh, build that love during the writing process? Uh -huh. um, what I try to do with, with, these, with characters, especially those that are, um, that are cruel, if, that's, if that is maybe the best way to describe them, I see them as complicated human beings, often trapped by choices that they have made. Um, and whether they whether they enjoy these acts of cruelty that they do or not, they also understand how trapped they have made themselves. That, that ability as a writer to, to pick that vulnerability, to see that and develop it, is what allows me to get close to those kinds of characters. 
in real life, those, I would not want to be around those people mm. at all. I think in real life, I'm much, I'm much more uh, protective of myself and, and of other people. But when I have characters, the point of writing, of course, is, is to explore these areas of, of human character, human nature, that we would not necessarily do because it's too dangerous in real life. Um, I think yesterday there was a wonderful conversation between Eleanor Catton and, and my dear friend Hannah, and um, they, I think um, Eleanor made a comment about we, you know, we have characters who do bad things in the service of the art so that we can explore through a novel this, this landscape. And uh, I think for me, I put my characters in situations of, of war or revolution or conflict that's external in order to let that external conflict magnify something mm -hmm. that is co complicated inside. Mm -hmm. I want to push my characters to see how far they might go um, because I want to test what human beings might be capable of. And even if I don't agree with what they've done, can I understand it? Um, and I do that because I think it's important to have literature that makes us uncomfortable, mm -hmm. that pushes us to read things that make us maybe uncomfortable so that when we face yes. those things in real life, and we're living now in a world where we are constantly bombarded with dis, dis uh, it's catastrophic visions of what human beings are capable of. Um, literature helps us ask questions that we don't always have the time to ask yeah. when real life is coming at us. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Burhan, how, how do you see yourself um, in this uh, question? Uh, be able to love your characters is important when you are building a novel, uh, trying to think how you are going to uh, develop the, the plot? Um, yes, before that, maybe I should add something uh, to what just Maza said. You know, uh, in, in your novel, you know, Shadow King, it, it is interesting uh, relation, you know, depicted there. A person doesn't mean a person. A person means uh, his or her village, mountain, family, nation, country, and towards the end of the book, you see to, uh, with their feelings, everything is united, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, Novalis said, oh no, uh, John Donne said, uh, no man is an island. And, and in, in such books, we see that. But in order to be able to achieve this, I think you, as a writer, uh, you need to love your characters, even the evil ones. I'm sure Dostoevsky was in now with Raskolnikov, mm -hmm. that brutal man who murdered two women just for money. Yes. Uh, but with his love, he drew a perfect picture of that character, and we started to love that murderer, not as a good man in his act, but as a personality that bringing his heart out and showing us everything, you know, his evil side and also good side. Mm -hmm. I think this is something we can achieve only by connecting ourselves with our characters. Mm -hmm. But do you have any experience that you can share with us with uh, refusing one character that came out in the very uh, early versions of your novels? Oh, maybe, okay, my, my second novel deals with World War II and it's Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia. Um, and I tell the story from both the Ethiopian perspective and the Italian perspective. And there were a few weeks where I entertained the thought of putting Mussolini in yes. the book, but I could not figure out how to, how to create him in a way that would complicate him. Mm -hmm. He was, uh, for me, the, the, the historical character was too real. Mm -hmm. And I needed to, I, 
he would take over the book as well. I mean, that was a powerful thing. So um, maybe that's one. But normally, if I'm hesitant, I mean, the, my general rule is if I'm hesitant about having a character go into a room or having them do something or having a, different, a kind of character that makes me uncomfortable, that's normally a clue for me that I need to go there. Mm -hmm. That's something the writing is telling me, you need to explore this place. Um, and, uh, and I see where it goes from there. But I've had moments in writing where um, the writing has disturbed me so much that uh, I don't read it again until it's time for a final revision, that I, I did it and, and that's it. You have any experience that you can share with us with characters uh, kept in the... Yeah, maybe I have uh, something else in related to this question. You know, uh, books we write and being published in many countries, we travel every week to a different places. But in fact, actually, you write your book just for a small group of people. My small group of people is my village. Uh, I was born in a small village in central Turkey in the middle of desert. The village is still there. I still go there regularly. All my relatives, they read my books, and they all believe that I am telling their stories. <laughs> Seriously. My mom always said, okay, write about your dad, okay? Okay, mom, I'm writing. <laughs> Seriously, always. She cannot read, uh, illiterate, and I say, okay, mom, I'm writing. When I go to village uh, all summertime, they come, they say, in that book you told a story, but the real story is this. Let's have a tea and I will tell you the story. Mm -hmm. And then use my name, he says. My neighbor, I used his father's name in my first novel. Mm -hmm. He said, why don't you use my name? I promised to use his name, but unfortunately he died this year. Mm -hmm. You know, my childhood friend, but I'm going to write his name, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, you feel that, okay? You are writing for those people, but that book is being read in, let's say, New York, or now in Obidosh, in, let's say, India. And it's interesting, you know, communication in our brain. You know, you have pen, paper, in a table. You have a few people around you in that room. You are not alone. Mm -hmm. Who are those people? Dostoevsky, Marquez, or my neighbor in the village? <laughs> That's love. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, uh, we are uh, um, a little bit further. We are going to talk about your novels, but uh, and it's the theme of love will take us everywhere. Uh, but I think one thing that we can uh, find in common uh, in these books in your writing, well, is the love of language. Of course, it's every writer has the love of language. But sometimes I feel that you are exploring um, the boundaries of language. You write in English, but you quote many uh, other language, and in your case also there's the example of your latest book that it's uh, written in, 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 Kur in, in, in Kurdish, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, how would you um, share with us this love for literature, for language, and how do you explore the, the boundaries of, of literature mm. and language? Uh. I, uh, I, I tell this story um, about the, the way I've come to think of what uh, language as it connects to um, writing, writing scenes that are uncomfortable, that are unpleasant, that might be violent. Um, I knew somebody uh, during the revolution of the 70s in Ethiopia who was one of the revolutionaries, and uh, she had been taken prisoner and had experienced really horrible interrogations. Mm -hmm. um, and she read my first book, which is set in that time. And she asked me later, she said, um, how did you know what it was like in that prison? And I, told, I said, I, I don't know. You know, I did, I did research. I said, but how did you survive this? And she said, well, she was kept in a cell that was quite small. I mean, this is a huge stage. It, it might be just this really tiny space. And she said every morning she would wake up and she would walk to her mother's house and then she would walk to her grandmother's house 
and then she would walk and visit a friend, and then she would come back and rest. And as she's telling me this story, she's getting up and walking this, the parameters of the cell. And I understood in that moment that there is something, there was something that her imagination was allowing her to do. There was a mercy in that imaginative leap into a different space. Uh, and I was thinking a lot about that um, as I was working on my second book. How is it possible that our imaginations have often given us, um, given us a mercy, given us an ability to, to be somewhere else? So I thought, can I work with that in language? Can I, in the process of writing very, very difficult scenes of, of brutality, force language and metaphor and the imagination to take the weight of that moment? How does a sentence look? How does it sound? How does a paragraph look when you're trying to do that? And so you will notice, if you're reading The Shadow King, that in moments of the most brutal acts, uh, the language gets more beautiful. It starts working with metaphor and images because my characters are understanding the place that their imagination can go, even as, as their body is experiencing something else. Um, and so my sentences, I wanted to push a sentence and see how much can a sentence hold. Uh, yeah, and I've, uh, you know, we'll see. I think my, my writing is, is an exploration of that on a completely artistic and creative level. What can language do? What is language capable of carrying for all of us? Because we all have this. Um, but in speaking, you know, with other languages, I, um, I grew up, I was born speaking Amharic. I, you know, this was my first language. My schooling has been mostly, it's been all English. But when I realize when I'm writing, um, quarter what seven. quarter to seven, everyone? Um, but when I'm writing, the cadences of, of Amharic come in. Mm -hmm. Even if I'm not using the words all the time, the rhythm is there. Uh, but in The Shadow King, I wanted to write what people would be speaking, which be both Italian and, and Amharic. Uh, if I'm not uh, wrong, you were raised in a Turkish language because the Kurdish was uh, forbidden. Um, so you have uh, two worlds, uh, one in your house, one in the school. You start writing novels in uh, the UK where the English was around you. How uh, your relation with language was um, developed? Um, this is, um, okay, the wound, the bleeding wound, maybe the right description uh, for my language or my relation with language. When I, okay, you speak Portuguese and English. Okay, you can switch, that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, I speak Turkish and English, I don't mind. But my mother tongue is Kurdish. Yes. It is not the same thing having Kurdish and Turkish, having Kurdish and English, because Kurdish is forbidden, beaten. At the school, if you speak with your Kurdish friend in your mother tongue, you will be beaten. At the military service, you, you would be sent to prison if you speak in Kurdish. In torture center, if you are Kurd, you get extra hour of torture, mm -hmm. just because of your origin. And in the end, you say, what is this? My mother spoke with me in that language, you know? Mother tongue is this. Mothers, you know, feed us with their breast. In one breast, they give us milk. In other breast, they give us their feelings, their language, their love for life. But that's cut off from you. They say, you are not what you are. You are something else. This is a real big struggle. It's a psychosis in Turkey, mm -hmm. uh, where 20 million Kurds live in Turkey. I don't know, what's the population in Portugal? 10 million? 10 million. 11. Yeah, yeah. So. 20 million Kurds forbidden. And it's not something new. 
It's been 100 years, still there's a civil war going on, and also in other countries, Syria, Iraq, and Iran, Kurds are being treated the same. And then I started to write novels, and it was in Turkish, because that's the official language I knew, and when I saw a Kurdish novel in my mother tongue for the first time, I was 35 years old. <laughs> now, how can you expect me to raise this language? You know, put it on the pedestal. I don't have that grammar ability mm -hmm. because I haven't read anything in my mother tongue for 30, 35 years because we have different grammar. And then I've written five novels in Turkish with the last one just published now. I said, no, I'm returning to my mother tongue. Mm -hmm. Okay, Istanbul population is 17 million. We have hundreds of bookshops, only in one bookshop, you can find my Kurdish book. But I don't care. Because it is act of love. Love is not for majority. It's for yourself, for your mother, for your childhood, for, for your that small barren village, whatever it is called. It's for respect, you know, to humanity. So we have love for humanity, we have love for characters, we have love for language, and now we have novels, and your uh, novels here. And well, we, when we have a, a conversation like this one, we are always trying to find some connections where we have the shadow in the both titles, um, and has a metaphor also. Uh, but you both quote Homer uh, in the beginning of the book. Uh, so I ask, uh, once uh, Burham told me in an interview that in Turkish, if you want to talk about the family, you're always talking about uh, politics, you are talking about uh, the history that has, be, has to be told. Do we need new songs, new epics uh, to talk about, uh, for instance, Ethiopia history and Turkish history? Is the idea of an epic, of a song bigger than life? Um, not that, and um, able to uh, talk about the things that happened in Ethiopia and no one wants to talk about? Uh, I was speaking earlier this morning about, uh, in Ethiopia we have what's called, uh, what are called the Asmari. Mm -hmm. And the Asmari are, they are in cities, but they're also in, in villages. They sing, they perform in bars. They also can perform in the middle of a, of a square. They, are, uh, they make up songs about anyone who's in the bar. They are telling the history of the village, the history of the parents of so-and-so. They reveal who's having an affair, who's, who's not. Um, and they pass down in that way the memory and the history of, of the people who live in this village or in this area. There are still songs being sung now that are about the people who fought against Mussolini in 35. And this is the way that a, a, a village remembers. It is oral history. And I know that is, this is, these griots, these troubadours, these singers are part of so many different cultures. So I don't know if Ethiopia needs a new song necessarily. Um, I, I believe that there, there has been, there have been stories that have been told amongst villagers, amongst farmers, among these small communities for centuries and for millennia. What has happened is we don't know how to listen. We haven't learned how to approach those stories and take them seriously. Um, we, we think that most of the histories that are, that are spoken of, of these communities, of these people, of these wars, exist only in official records and in the archives. And yet, the, the songs that people have sung about themselves, that are songs often spoken in love, even if they're, they are joking or they are quite dirty, um, we don't think of that as history, and yet this is, these are for me as, as, as fundamental to understanding mm -hmm. communities as anything else. If, um, yeah. uh, we, we can read the, 
the stone in the shadow has a love story uh, between two, uh, two lovers, but uh, at the same time, it's a chronicle of the 20th century uh, from the point of view of Turkey. Uh, of Turkey. Um, was, did you have the intention to have a, a big scale, uh, a, a big epic of common people during all these wars, revolution, um, and oppression? Uh, yes. Uh, one of the points uh, I wanted to express is because, okay, I'm part of an oppressed nation. Mm -hmm. My demand and my expectation is to be understood and to be loved by others, okay? Mm -hmm. Neighboring nations, they should respect us. But do I love other nations? Mm -hmm. Because I have to ask the same question to myself, okay? And what is the sign of love? In, in a social environment. I put a character here who speaks seven languages of all communities living in that region. That's a way of love, you know? You speak the language of your neighbor and the other neighbor. My mom, she couldn't read and write, but she could speak four languages, mm -hmm. you know? Because we have different communities, they, they learned it, they respected each other, they tried to understand their feelings in their language. So this is one of the ways to promote peace, understanding, you know, and new ways of building up relations between people, between nations, between societies. Otherwise, we will always praise our own nation, we will always talk about our own wound and it will only create new national borders. Mm -hmm. That means war. This is what we are seeing now in the world. You know, nationalism or this populist, uh, populist politics is, you know, very fashionable, mm -hmm. you know, very trendy and you just follow them. No, we have to have a new way of love and social relation against this current political atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that's very interesting. And. and your, your character is all one of your characters uh, are uh, always reminding that uh, uh, there's a, a surface but there are many layers uh, and if we if we go through all that layers we find that we are much more closer than we thought uh, there used to be a church then it, it, the church was rebuilt transformed in other things like uh, Agia Sophia for example so sometimes if we only look at the surface, we forgot the roots where we come from? Uh, yes, you know, in the book, there is one character. He's a torturer. Mm -hmm. He tortures a girl and rapes her. And, uh, but I didn't tell that part much. I tried to show that torture's personal wound and, you know, his psychological problems, try to understand him, mm -hmm. not to forgive him. Okay, we shouldn't forgive, mm -hmm. okay? But we should understand there is a human being in that dirt. Mm -hmm. That dirt created by politicians, by an evil society, by our neglect. But in the end, we should see that there is a gem there for the future of humanity. We should try to, you know, find it and share it with each other. Mm -hmm. I think the art is, in the end, is mm -hmm. to understand the hope within the crisis and then reshape it for our future. Mm -hmm. um, well, in the morning, I promised that I won't repeat any question that was posed in the presentation, but you must talk about uh, the, your family history connected to the Shadow King, U Rey Sombra, because it was inspired uh, in your grandmother. So this is in, uh, we are in the uh, Italian Abyssinian War. Mussolini is invading um, Ethiopia. And this is not just a man's history. It's a history about women. Yes. Um, and maybe this is also a, a kind of story of, of love. Um, my my great grandmother, when she, when uh, Mussolini was getting ready to invade, and uh, there was a mobilization call across the country, the eldest of every family, bring your weapon and enlist. My great grandmother was a young girl at the time, but she was the eldest of her family, so she told her father. She had three other brothers, and they were, they were quite small. She said, well, I'm the oldest, and I will go. 
And uh, her father said, you will not, you're a girl. But she was in an arranged marriage with a man who was much older than she was. Um, and uh, she was way too young at that point to go live with an adult man, so she was still living at home. She wasn't quite a wife yet, even though she was married. He said, I will give my gun to your husband, and he will go in to represent the family. She said, no, he will not. And I don't know what kind of fight happened between them, but eventually my great-grandmother took her father to court to fight for that rifle, which you will see in the book, um, to get that rifle back from this man that she did not like, she did not love him, uh, and to go to war. And she won that court case. She pled her case and she won. She went to war um, and that began, uh, that was my family story of, of this, of this great-grandmother. And uh, when I asked my mother, after years of researching my novel, and the novel was almost done, she just happened to say, I was telling her, oh, I found these women, I found these women, I think I found this, there must have been women in fighting in the war because I'm finding research. I spent about 10 years researching this book, and she said, well, what about your great-grandmother? I said, what? You know, and I said, she said, yeah, she went to war and she told me the story. I said, why didn't you tell me? And she said, you never asked. Um, and, and so I said, what do you mean I never, I never, I never asked. I never asked if it was in my family, even though I was researching. I never conceived that the stories that the women in my family told in the spaces where women gather, in the kitchen, in the bedroom, separated from the men at a party, that that is history also. Um, and I, it has taught me a lesson, and I always tell people now, please, all of you, go to home, go to your relatives and say, what didn't you tell me? What haven't you told me yet? And see what comes out yes. from that. Um, but I think that, and of course, I've always wondered, someone has asked me, okay, what, what happened to your great-grandmother afterwards? And I've always, and this is a story maybe also of a kind of love, seven o'clock. Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock. The clock ticks. Yes. Um, but what is it like um, for women who were part of liberation movements, who were part of revolutionaries, uh, who were part of these movements, and I know that that exists here in, in Portugal at all, at also, what is it like to fight and then come back and be somebody's wife? or be somebody's daughter. When you are a soldier in the field or you're fighting, you're a rebel, what is, what is, how do you change inside? Mm -hmm. And my great-grandmother came back from that war and divorced her husband and then decided that she would take as many lovers as she wanted. Mm -hmm. And so, like, we have a big family. <laughs> <laughs> In, in Portugal, we say that she was a woman of, uh, of weapons, literally. <laughs> Many weapons. <laughs> Many weapons. Um, Burham, you have a very strong uh, main character, Avdo, that it's a tombstone sculpture. Um, is it a, a metaphor for what rests f of our path in life, what uh, may uh, st stand still after everything that we have uh, done? Uh, yeah, towards the end of the book, I uh, started to understand uh, the role of Avdo, the main protagonist in the book. He's a very old man. He's carving stone for newly, you know, died people. And when he carves a stone, he always first asks the story of that man who died, okay? Man or woman. And then through the story, he tries to find their spirit, and then reflect it on the stone. And then I realized that actually, Avdo himself is a gravestone mm -hmm. of his country, his past, of the you know, whole 20th century. Then throughout his life story in that book, um, I tried to picture the story of the whole country, the whole region, you know, from Istanbul to Cairo to Italy. Uh, so Avdo means the whole geography for me. Mm -hmm. um, 
we are getting to the end of the session, so we, uh, estamos a chegar ao fim da sessão e terão a oportunidade de fazer as vossas perguntas. Vou só colocar mais uma questão. I was saying that the session is in the end. They will be able to to make their questions, to pose their questions. Um, in your in your book, uh, but I'm just giving some time to uh, ice breaking, you know. <laughs> um, in your book, uh, you create. Um, you transform a common uh, citizen in an emperor yeah. because uh, the Ethiopian emperor for the first time uh, fled uh, Ethiopia. It's a, also a metaphor of the power of fiction that can uh, drive people to believe, to struggle beyond their strengths. Yes, I mean, it's, it's really... Um Here's this common man that, that looked like Haile Selassie. And so when Haile Selassie fled Ethiopia during this war, here this man was chosen to dress up like the emperor and continue to give the people some you know, uh, inspiration. Um, it, yes, the common man, but the man's name, Minim, in Amharic means nothing. And so for me, I was also questioning what is power? if a man who is nothing can represent this person that is supposedly a descendant of King David and the Solomonic line, if a peasant can, can become him, what is really power? What is the nature of power? And uh, yeah, can we just dress, dress it up and pretend like it is, it is whatever we want it to be? Uh, and so I, yeah, I mean, as, as the United States gets closer and closer to a, an election that is likely disastrous no matter what, mm. um, that what is the nature of power? <laughs> is, yeah. Uh, in your book, uh, The Shadow, and the, the Stone and the Shadow, but also in Istanbul, Istanbul, the story is often used to uh, get people together, and in the, in the case of Istanbul, Istanbul, to survive a prison. Do you, have, do you think that the story has the power uh, to help people survive the worst moments of their lives? Uh, yes, you know, it's a straight uh, answer to this question. And when I was in that uh, torture center, I was 19 years old. Um, in that small cell, I remember there was a journalist and uh, he was more experienced in torture ses sessions and prison. Uh, he was a very smart man. And, they often uh, are. Yes, and uh, <laughs> it was my second, because they were, they've been there for a long time. I was a newcomer and the youngest student. And he, he said, now I'm going to tell you a story, the story of the Spartacus. Mm -hmm. mm. And we said, oh, okay, I heard the name, but What's that? And then he told us the story. Apparently, he watched that movie by Kirk Douglas. <laughs> and, uh, and then we started to tell stories to each other. You know, uh, between torture sessions, you go, you hear, you know, screams. But talking there and sharing story and uh, creating something new, you know, with the wounded people just next to you, I think the power of mankind, you know. Uh, I grew up in a small village, as I said, there was no electricity. And uh, we didn't have radio or TV. My mom was a very good storyteller. At night, we would just gather in, the, in that room with uh, kids. And uh, in that dim uh, light, she would tell the stories. But then I realized, I collected all of her stories, just 20 stories, hmm. but for years, she always told the same stories to us. But then I realized, actually, they were not the same story every time. Because if she had a happy day, she would tell us you know, that story in a different voice. Hmm. If she had a very sad day, and then the story, the storyline is same, but the intonation is changing, and then you try to understand or you try to feel the psychology of your mother through that language, that stories. I think there are so many different layers telling a story and that's what made us human, maybe. Mm. 
Temos então agora tempo para... Uh, you, you can use now the, the translation. Uh, temos agora tempo para as vossas uh, perguntas. Eu disse à Maza e ao Burham que não há público como o Diobidos uh, sempre a colocar uh, perguntas, por isso não me deixem mal hoje. Podem fazer perguntas, uh, para, uh, comentários. Ainda temos algum tempo. Temos já aqui uma pergunta. Hello, uh, olá, I'm Patricia, I'm a yoga teacher and I'm also an environment engineer. Eu sou professora de yoga e sou engenheira do ambiente. So, um, I think um, I would like to ask to both of you the process of creative, of writing, um, it, how that happened. How that, uh, what was, you already told was the seed, I understood a little bit, but how did you carry on? Because love, um, I don't know, I think it's uh, emotion, but genuine love usually stays. Do you understand what I'm saying? It doesn't disappear like that. You can let it go, the person, you can let it go, the object, but it stays with you. It's in you in your body, in your mind, whatever, in all the levels that we have. And so my question goes toward to you, because probably there's times in your life that maybe you don't want to no longer write. How do you carry on in that times? What's the love? How do you, how do you, how do, you do in your creative process? So just two more things. For me, love, the first author I wrote, I read about, Love was um, Erich Form, Erich Form, who talks about the different loves, mm -hmm. the, the different loves, um, uh, the maternal, the social. Mm -hmm. So was the first person who put in perspective the mm -hmm. the conditional, mm -hmm. non condition the God love. Yeah. Se calhar tínhamos que deixar a responder para dar tempo a outras não, pessoas. Não, não, eu estava apenas dizendo que este foi o meu primeiro contato com o amor, que me faz... E é hoje que eu vim aqui e eu estava muito feliz de ver a proposta de tantos pontos. Uma mais coisa. Porque eu gostaria de perguntar ao... Burham. Burham. Pessoas que são órfãs e não tinham mãe, How do they, you know, because you've been talking about cutting um, mm -hmm. the connection of writing with the mother, t mother language, with the motherhood, how they can do it, how they can carry, what do you think it would be like, was, it's, mm -hmm. it's a little bit of a challenging because it, to me the narrative is always very connected to the mother, so sorry. So uh, a brief comment about your writing process? And um, if is it connected to love? And if you want to say something about uh, how can uh, an orphan um, ties with the language and with mo uh, mother love in different ways? Yeah, I think um, well, very quickly so because I know we're running out of time. Part of part of the work of, of writing is also discipline. It's not just an emotion, it's actually developing a routine and, and sticking to it. And uh, Borhan and I and, and my husband were having a conversation this morning about how we do this, how you, how you make the time in your day to do it, because it's, it's not just an emotion, it is actually, it's work. Yeah. Um, Tolstoy has a theory about a uh, novel it's very controversial theory, but there is one point I like very much. He says that a novel should be genuine, sincere. That means it should be able to convince readers. Even the story takes place, let's say, on another planet or in, in the year, let's say, 5,000 years ahead. But the, the setting should be very convincing, you know, very consistent with each other, everything. And I think there you are, again, uh, shaping a new web of love in that story by uh, sincerity, by genuinity. 
And uh, if you are lucky and successful as a writer, then it becomes a beautiful book. Há uh, mais alguma pergunta? Alguma partilha? Uh, para vos inspirar, eu vou só ler aqui duas passagens dos livros que talvez possam ser um, um motivo pelo qual vão ler ou reler este livro. I'm just reading the... Uh, do livro uh, Pedra e Sombra. Por um momento, Reham captou nos olhos de Ave de uma expressão semelhante à sua. Uma expressão que dizia que a joia preciosa chamada amor podia crescer no corpo de um ser humano e transmitir-se aos outros. Aquela expressão que desde há séculos passava de geração em geração não só lhes dava um novo futuro, como abria uma janela para o novo passado. Acreditariam um no outro. Nesse passado, encontrar-se-iam um no outro. Juntos, veriam com novos olhos as pessoas que tinham conhecido e já não existiam. Continuariam a viver seguindo o rastro de uma nostalgia que se transmitia de um coração a outro. E agora do Rei Sombra. Cantem, filhas, uma mulher e mil mulheres, as hordas que correram com o vento para libertar um país de bestas venenosas. Cantem, crianças, quem veio antes de vós, quem abriu o caminho no qual se encaminham para os sóis mais quentes. Cantem, homens, a valorosa Esther e a furibunda Irut e a luz com que ofuscaram a uma terra ensombrada. Cantem quem já cá não está. Cantem os gigantes que ainda vivem entre nós. Cantem os que ainda estão por nascer. Cantem. Thank you so much, Mazen Borham.